Next, we offer an encore presentation of our tour of New Salem, Illinois, where Abraham Lincoln spent seven years of his early adulthood, made lifelong friends, and helped lay the foundation that sent him on the road to the White House. This runs about 50 minutes. Well, Charlie Starling, I appreciate you taking the time to show us around New Salem Park. Tell me, uh, how long has have the buildings that we're going to be taking a look at today, how long have these been here? And, and why is the village reconstructed on this spot? Well, this is actually where the village was originally, and it's been here since the 1930s. It was reconstructed by one construction company, and then a, the CCCs, the Civilian Conservation Corps, came here. And they were here about six and a half years. And they rebuilt the village mostly as you see it today. And how did they know where to locate the actual buildings when we see them standing today? Well, we had the original survey, but we didn't have the original survey starting point. And we had a lot of information as to where the houses were. And the archaeologists actually did the digging and found some of the cornerstones. Some places they found good parts of the total foundation. So then the buildings were rebuilt as closely as possible where they were. Mm -hmm. And of course, you don't dress like this on your everyday life. You're a, a what, what do you call yourself, a historical recreator? We're historical interpreters. Uh, we try to recreate the village as it would have been in the 1830s, so that people get a feel for what it was when Lincoln lived here. In the 1830s. Now, New Salem is located, for those who haven't yet been to the park, about where in relation to Springfield? We're 22 miles north, a little bit west of Springfield, on Route 9, uh, 125 out of Springfield, and then 97. And I would say what? It's roughly a 25-minute drive, perhaps, from downtown? 25 minutes to a half hour, right. So for those who may be coming to see the new Lincoln Presidential Museum, uh, they can see that. They could also take a, a, a little side trip out here if they if they want and, and see where Lincoln actually lived then in the 1830s. Right. Uh, the museum's on Jefferson Street. If they come out Jefferson, they'll be right on Route 12597. Let's start with just a little bit of, uh, we're going to see, I guess, two levels of history. One is the, the history that's specific to Abraham Lincoln, uh, which is why New Salem is here and, and why it's significant. But on the other hand, visitors as they come will see uh, other people who are going to be dressed in period pieces and, and engaged in activities that are part and parcel of life in the prairie in the 1830s, is that right? Right. What we try to do uh, is to show people we can how these people lived, the activities that they had on a day-to-day -day basis, and the way they cooked, uh, the way that they had to go for, and this is a commercial village, so you're going to see a lot of different things like the woodworkers, the blacksmith, and we have uh, barrel makers and things of that nature that are taking place almost all the time. I want to get started and take a look at some of it just shortly, but first just tell us how long did, did the village, what was the lifespan of this community? Well, originally it started 1829, uh, lasted about a little over 10 years. By 1840, this village is totally gone. The only building that was occupied at that time was the tavern. And the local people were very interested in the history of the village, and consequently, through their efforts, uh, the village was reconstructed in the 1930s. And even that is a little historic because it was part of the uh, CCC program the, under Franklin Roosevelt. Is that right, right, it was part of the New Deal. And the uh, fellows that worked here were anywhere from ages 17 to 21. And there's usually about 200 people at a time, the information that we have. And uh, they rebuilt the village, so they, they spent a lot of time here. As we go through and meet some of the other historical reenactors, what, how many um, of you are there roughly, and, and are you paid, or are you volunteers, or both? We have both. We have uh, full-time people. Uh, at this point, just two of us are full-time in the village. Uh, we have about 15 that are here for six months of the year during the really busy period. And then uh, in the summer, we'll have some high school and college children who come here and work for three months. And then we have about 300 volunteers who pretty much dictate their own time. Uh -huh. uh, we like them to work about 25 hours a year uh, to be in good standing. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm sure I'll have other questions, but I'm interested in getting started. So why don't we take a look at the first cabin? What is it that we're going to take a look at? Well, this is uh, Henry Onstott's home. 
And it's one of the largest homes that you're going to see in the village, and it was one of the last ones that was built here. And we really don't have any cabins as such. Log cabins would have had dirt floors, no doors, no windows, no chimneys. So these are vast improvements over log cabins. So while we lay people refer to them as log cabins, what would you refer to it as? A log house. A log house, log house because right. it had a floor. Right, and a door. And, and who was window. Henry Anst? Henry Anst was a village Anst. cooper. And this is the third home that he had in the village. And the cooper makes these wonderful barrels, buckets, tubs. And we also have information that he did some work on the carting mill because it's all wooden geared. And he also, uh, at one point, he built a casket. So anything that was woodworking, uh, he could do. Great. Well, let's take a look. Come on. Great. Well, Terry, I'd like to show you Henry Onstadt's home. It's one of the largest and one of the nicest homes that we have here. Uh, it also has a lot of the original artifacts that a lot of people are usually curious about. But it's one of the largest homes. It has two rooms. The other one is just identical to this one. It has two fireplaces. It's a typical southern upland pile of home. And the Onstadt's had five children, so it was a rather busy place. Uh, Five children. Five. Mm -hmm. That's amazing because, and you say this is one of the larger cabins. It is not by our standards of today at all. A large, it's roughly the size of a garage, I would say. Yeah, about a two-car garage. <laughs> but at the same time, they did have two more children, so they added a little lean-to off the back there. Uh, while they were living here, they had two more children, so they did that. But uh, you're right, it's a very busy place. Uh, the average family was nine children, so wow. a lot of them had many more than what we see at this place. The fireplace behind you, of course, would have been one of the ways to heat the home. But as I gather, it was probably also the kitchen and the main means of cooking meals. Right. The women spent probably a good majority of their time here because with the cooking crane, they're going to be cooking probably uh, six or eight hours of the day they're going to spend their time right here at the hearth. And it was the way that the building was uh, heated in the winter. One thing we didn't talk about when we were talking outside, it was the, you know, the history of the, of the town. Why did the town fade out of existence? Well, a lot of the history books refer to it as it's the main reason that the village failed was because the river wasn't navigable. But that's just part of the picture. And that would be the Sangamon uh, River? Right, the Sangamon River, which is at the, uh, the east end of the village. Uh, but there's a number of things that contributed to the demise of this village. First of all, it's a commercial village, and it was landbound. It couldn't get any bigger than what you're going to see it today. So the farmers owned the land around it. They didn't want to sell. So as more and more people moved into central Illinois, this village can't grow. So a couple of our people left here and went two miles north and started what is today Petersburg. And then once they had started it, a flatboat by the name of a steamboat, actually, by the name of Utility, got stuck at Petersburg. And they dismantled it, so they have a steam engine that runs there every day. <laughs> our mill at the river doesn't run when the water's high, low, or frozen, which is probably a good part of the time. So, uh, and, and again, in the 18th century, the rivers were the highways right. of today. They were why any of the towns, whether it's St. Louis, Cincinnati, or New Salem, were located where they were. And I guess just ultimately, uh, this was somewhat of an inferior location to Petersburg. Well, it's not that much different, really. But at the same time, the main mode of transportation was the waterways. But the other things that influenced the demise of this village was that uh, when Lincoln left here in 36 to go to Vandalia, he gave up being postmaster and they moved it to Petersburg. So now the farmers have to go to Petersburg to check on their mail. And then in 39, the real demise of this village was contributed by the state of Illinois, cutting off the north end of Sangamon County and making Menard, and Petersburg became the county seat. Mm -hmm. So everything had to be recorded there. The legal courts meet there, the county court commission. All these things take place in Petersburg. So you get massive migration of farmers to Petersburg. And all these people that are depending on the farmers for their livelihood they pack up and move to Petersburg also. One of the things I think is so interesting for people to realize is that they really don't have to be all that interested in Abraham Lincoln, I think, to really enjoy their trip here. I mean, many people who are interested in Lincoln will have that layer of history, but we have here uh, Janet, uh, one of the uh, historical 
reenactors, and maybe we could uh, have you tell us what Janet's working on and, and what is the role of, again, some of the reenactors. She's making a quilt, a uh, very colorful one. Um, this is a log cabin design. Log cabin design. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. Yeah. And how Janet, how working on this? Um, this is this is a project that I started last winter and got it all pieced together. Now I'm working on the quilting portion of it. Um, and I, the this is how they would have done it. Um, had to be hand quilted. Hmm. How long would you say it's going to take to finish this? Um, probably I'll have this finished in about a month and a half. Month and a half. Yeah. Do you have anyone helping you? No. Me, myself, and I. <laughs> <laughs> but it, um, they would have had uh, quilting bees, and the ladies would have gotten together and quilted uh, in, in a group. So and it the, could be a community project. It would be a community project, and they would have gotten them done much faster because they were needed for the wintertime for warmth. And Janet, where would they have uh, gotten the cloth to make the quilts? Where did this, the raw supplies? Oh, the, the cloth could have come from the second Barry Lincoln store, which you might be seeing later down in the village. They would have uh, brought it up by flat boat from St. Louis. And what would you use? Would you put uh, some kind of a stuffing in here, for lack of a better term, or filler? In between the cloth, or is this, is this uh, just cloth itself? Yeah, there, there's a, a batting in between the two layers of cloth. And that also would have come from the store? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, how, um, how long have you been working here? Um, I've been here as a volunteer for about three years now. What kind of questions do you hear from some of the visitors that come? Um, where was Lincoln's house? That's the number one question <laughs> that I have, is where did Lincoln live? And I presume we're going to take a look at that at some point along the line. He lived in a lot of these homes at different times. Uh, young single men didn't build homes. They usually hired out for room and board. So if someone needed help, that's where he would go. So yeah. it was more of a back room or something? Uh, Anywhere, yeah, or just sometimes just space on the floor. Uh, when they talk about room and board, it, it's not necessarily a bed. It's a place where he could sleep. Uh, so he'd be here tomorrow morning when the sun comes up, ready to go to work again. Well, Charlie, I know there's a lot of, how many, by the way, buildings are there here in the reconstructed New Salem? There's 23 uh, main buildings, and there's a lot of outhouses, barns, and we have uh, the shed, and there are also smokehouses and uh, privies. So there's, there's a lot of smaller buildings, but there's 23 main buildings. Great. Well, I'm anxious to see some more. Okay. Thank you. We'll just go down the road. So what's next? Well, we have another home, but before we get there, I'd like to point out to you this ash hopper, which was very important to these people, and it's one of the chores that the boys had every day was to clean the fireplace, and the cold ashes went in the hopper, and it's important that you have a lid so that rain can't get in it. And when this thing gets full, you pour rainwater, a barrel of rainwater in. It takes about 10 to 14 days for the water to permeate down through those ashes, and lye solution comes out. So uh, and, again, let me, let me make it. What was the purpose of throwing their ashes in there? We're saving them so we can make lye. And what would they do with lye? Well, they had a lot of uses for lye. They scald their hogs in lye solution when they're butchering so they're clean externally. They use lye to mix with the white so that'll harden on the walls. They use lye to hard leather for soles and heels of shoes so that it would last longer. Mm -hmm. And they use lye to make lye hominy from corn. And then the women folks use lye to make soap. Soap. Yeah. And what, was that entirely, how was it, what was there some other ingredients? How well, did you use tallow, uh, beef fat, lamb fat, whatever you had available. And that's cooked with the lye. And when it hardens, you have hard soap. But they also made soft soap. But they don't make a lot of soap. They only get a bath twice a year. <laughs> oh, Routinely, they would take a bath twice a year. The spring and the fall. It's amazing. Well, it's also amazing that it just underscores the point that uh, while they could buy some things, and I guess from, from the store that we'll see later on, on the other hand, they really had to be so much more self-sufficient and create things that we take for granted today, just, just like everyday soap. Right. They, 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 they really had to work uh, a good part of the time just producing the things that were absolutely necessary. The things they're going to buy are the things that they can't produce or they can't get from a neighbor. Well, that's great.
Let's take a look at the next one. Okay. <laughs> and what is this uh, structure we're going to be seeing, Charles? This is Trent Brothers, Trent Brothers Home. It's another one of the rather larger homes in the village. So where are we now, Charles? Well, this is the Trent Brothers Home. And? It's also one of the larger homes, but this is the New England style that I was telling you about earlier, where you have the fireplace in the middle of the home, and then one fireplace heats all three rooms. It's much more efficient than what we saw over there. Right, the, so we have actually three rooms in this, uh, larger than, a little bit larger than the last home we saw. Yes, just slightly. And uh, who are we? This is Phyllis, and Phyllis is obviously working on a loom. I think most right, of us would this recognize is, that barn room, mm -hmm. one of the larger ones that we have here. Phyllis, can you tell us a little bit about what it is you're doing and, and how does this work? Well, the, uh, the loom is extremely old and it works very well yet today. And I'm weaving a piece of linen and that is something, that, of course, that would have been done back in this time period. Uh, let's see. This piece ahead of it, the dark colors are wool, and they used a lot of wool. They also used a lot of cotton back in our time period as well. Uh, we're using a boat shuttle, which is a new one, but of course they had boat shuttles in this time period. Can you hold up that boat shuttle? Sure. I'm not sure. It's a new, but they mm -hmm. had the same thing. We have a few new parts on the, on the loom, as you can see, but uh, it's very old appropriate for a home loom of the time period, not a professional. Home weavers were mostly women, professional weavers were mostly men. How common were it was a loom such as this? Not very, and by 1830 we were in the declining years of home weaving. Uh, there was a lot of fabric available at the stores. There was still some being done, we know that, but it was in the declining year. Uh, back before the Revolutionary War, but when it was necessary, more necessary, 20 to 25 percent of the homes, they think, ever had their own loom. Hmm. But then you would contract with a professional for what you needed. And yeah. actually, what was it that they were making? Were these bed sheets? Uh, were they tablecloths? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes to both. <laughs> uh, blankets, things for the home, coverlets, uh, sheets, tablecloths, toweling, some fabric, but by now you could buy the fabric at the stores. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Charles, let's go over just if we might. Um, this, uh, let's take a look at the fireplace, which you alluded to, and I don't know if we got a shot of it before. So you're saying this was the one fireplace that would heat the entire house? Yes. Uh, the back room is heated from the back of the fireplace, uh, and it captures the heat off the back side, and then the heat from the front of it here would heat this main room and the bedroom that we have off to the right of us here. And what was the name again of this, the, 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 the man who owned this? This was the Trent Brothers. The Trent yeah, Brothers, they, and what did he... They, are, they, they ran a ferry down at the uh, river for a while, and they also were in the mercantile business for a short time. And what does that mean? We've heard that term, but what does mercantile mean? They were in the store business, the general stores. Okay. And I don't know if, uh, if we can have Tony come over and just take a shot inside this room. What is this? This is unusual. At least we didn't see it in the previous room. What is this room? Well, this is primarily a bedroom. Uh, the, the rooms weren't used for just one specific use. It would also be used for storage or, uh, uh, and you'll notice that we have a large trunk under the bed and you have a cradle for a baby here. So it, it had multiple uses. Now you, you referenced earlier, and this is I s assume not the home that Lincoln lived in, but, but you said where Lincoln boarded, would he have boarded in a room such he as this? He could have, sure. They weren't very specific about where they slept. As long as there was a space, they could put a uh, uh, sack of straw or corn shucks, and they would make themselves as comfortable as possible on the floor. Well, Phyllis, I thank you for showing us the loom. And uh, why don't we go ahead and take a look at the next home that's on our We'll head down the road here, Terry. Great, thank you. Well, Terry, we're coming to a very interesting building here. This is the church and the school. Uh, originally, it was a hard shell Baptist church, and our schoolmaster, Mentor Graham, got permission to use this building as a school, and it's called a blab school, where all the lessons were done out loud. And why and, was it called a blab, a blab school? Because the kids were all talking at the same time? Yes. Yeah, they said you could hear blab school sometimes a mile away. 
And Lincoln actually said he went to a blab school in Indiana with his sister Sarah, but he did not attend this specific school. So when we often think of the one-room schoolhouse of Lord, this is one of those. This is a great example of a one-room schoolhouse. Although it's very early, and we're in the far west. Illinois was considered the far west in 1830. So what you're seeing here is what was available on the frontier. What kind of, what lessons would they learn? Mostly reading, writing, and ciphering. Uh, ciphering is what we call arithmetic today. And they would go over their lessons. Uh, they weren't really concerned that you understood what you were doing, but you will memorize it. You would memorize it. And how many students would typically be in, in a school like this, or do we know how many students went there? Well, I don't think you could say typical, because no day was typical. Uh, on a nice, sunshiny day, if it was planting or harvesting, there would be very few children because work at home took presence over the school. So there weren't school days. It was like you went to school when the, your parents didn't need you to do something else. That's right. That's right. Uh, as long as there was nothing really that had to be done at home, then you went to school. And, and inside were, the, I'm sorry, I was going to say inside the building, tell us what, what are some of the things we see that... Uh, well, you'll see the benches that they sat on. They're called punching benches. Uh, they're very hard and I'm sure not very comfortable. Uh, and you see a writing desk with the elongated window where they would select six or eight students each day that had to bring a board made out of oak or hickory so it was white and they would put a stick in the fire and when the stick got black and charcoal they would write with the black stick on their white board. That's fascinating. So they even made, we were talking before about self-sufficiency, they made their own as pencils much, of those sorts. Huh? As much as possible. So they wrote with ash on the board and when the ash came off, how did they write again? Well. When your board got so dirty you couldn't wipe it clean, you had to take it home, have your paw take a draw knife and shave it off so you could come back and do some more writing. <laughs> yeah. A little different than today. Quite different, yes. So it was also the church? Uh, on Sunday, the Sabbath, we would have church here, yes. Uh, it depends on which preacher came to town. Sometimes it would be the Baptists on the majority of the time, but if Peter Cartwright happened to show up and no one else was here, then you would have a Methodist service. That's interesting, and, and uh, were the people very religious? Was it generally the thing to do to go to church on Sunday? The records indicate that probably one-fourth, 25% of the people belonged to an organized church. So Lincoln wasn't so unusual. 75% of the people didn't. Did Lincoln belong to an organized church? No. Mm -hmm. As far as we know, Lincoln never actually belonged to a church. He did go to church, particularly in the later years and while he was president. But uh, at this particular time, he's got a lot of questions about religion. Right. Well, I know there's more things to see, so why don't we go take a look at that? Okay, fine. Well, this is the uh, Barry Lincoln store. This is where Lincoln was the proprietor. This is where he actually started in the mercantile business. And what you see here is basically what was available at the time and what he could possibly have had in the store. You see the tinware, which was real common. People used it most commonly in the home. And then we have some plates here. They're actually reproductions of what these people had. We did some archaeology in 95 and found pieces and then had these plates recreated. This would be a dead poor man's plate, very plain. And this would be a middle class plate where it has some design to it. And the wealthier folks could buy the transfer patterns which was imported from England. So you have a, quite a variety of things that were available. You could get different things. The women would buy their vinegar and whiskey was probably one of the most common things. If the men didn't bring their own jug, they could buy a flask of this nature and fill it. And then they could sit outside and do their sipping, sitting and spitting. <laughs> and talk about politics or their crops or whatever was important at the time. Uh, which is, this was a gathering place. Uh, they would come here and Lincoln was also known to read the local papers. Uh, a lot of these people couldn't read or write, but Lincoln would uh, read the paper and then they would have these open discussions, uh, particularly about politics. That was really a big thing in the 1830s. How Everyone, long was, was the store? So Lincoln was one of the proprietors of the store here. Yes. And uh, how long did they have the store? I think he was here about four and a half months total because what happened was the 
what we call the second Barry Lincoln store, which is up the road and on the opposite side of the street, which was much larger, and on the main road from Springfield to Havana. So the stagecoaches and a lot of people that were traveling went by there. He thought he would do much better, but he didn't do much better. He was there about four and a half to six months, we think, and uh, that's basically where Lincoln went bankrupt in the mercantile business. When he left New Salem, he was in debt over $1,200 that we know of, and it may have possibly been more than that. Did he uh, legally declare bankruptcy? Legally, in the aspects of what they would have in those days, Lincoln assumed all the debts of the partnership, and it took him about 14 and a half years to pay it off, but he did pay it all back. We look here, and you, you'd re reference this, and we have uh, rye whiskey and peach brandy and hard cider. Was this imported, or did they, would they be making their own whiskey? Well, this particular barrel looks like it came from Pittsburgh, but uh, there was a local um, still, actually, there was two stills in this village. Uh, one they found when they did the archaeology in 95. And uh, the quickest way to convert your corn to cash was to distill it. There's a tremendous demand for whiskey here. Now, the, the, this is a relatively small building. Would Lincoln have lived here during the time that he was one of the proprietors? He slept in the back room. It's actually a storeroom, uh, and he would probably keep the fire going throughout the night. Uh, so he stayed here the majority of the time. And these stores were actually open 12 to 14 hours a day, and that's why a lot of times stores in this period are partnerships, because they cover for each other and gives them a chance to get away occasionally. You have a little scale behind us. What's the story on that? Well, this is a balanced scale. Uh, this is uh, the type of scale that Lincoln used. And Lincoln was known as uh, Honest Abe. And part of that supposedly comes from a little story that happened here. A lady by the name of Clarissa Hornbuckle came here and wanted to buy a quarter pound of tea. And Lincoln was talking politics and not paying close attention. And he used the wrong weight. And at the end of the day, when he was closing his books, he realized he'd made a mistake. So the next day, he walked six miles to give Clarissa another eighth of a pound of tea. The part of the story they don't usually tell you is that he just happened to arrive at supper time. She was known to be the one of the best cooks in the county. That's what she... Well, Charles, I'm interested in seeing what else we have uh, to see here in New Salem. Why don't we go ahead and take a look at that? Good. We'll go down the road and go to the tavern. Right, I look forward to seeing it. So Charlie, I guess this is what we might almost call Main Street, New Salem here. Basically, this is the Main Street. This is where the village actually started after they built the mill down the river. These were the very first buildings that were built here. This is what we commonly refer to as the commercial part of the village where you have, you know, two or three stores. We have Dr. John Allen and Sam Hill stores right over here behind us. Let me ask you, what and do we have right here? As an this is the store that Lincoln moved to. When they moved from the first, they moved down here. The main road from Springfield to Havana went right between these buildings. So and this is a crossroads for commerce right, in a sense. Right, huh? right. Uh, and they thought they would do better, but uh, unfortunately the economic situation today did, was very unfavorable. And Many of the people that were in the village, only 19 of the 21 people who were here failed. So only two actually survived and did quite well. Huh. And who were those? Sam Hill was one, and then Dr. Allen was in a uh, silent partnership, and uh, they were quite successful. They also moved to Petersburg. In fact, if we can take a look at this two-story building, the, the buildings have a little bit of explanatory uh, signage on them, and that's Sam Hill's cabin, is that right? The, the yeah, two-story building. Yeah, that's the only two-story building in the village. Uh, 1835, uh, Sam got married to Parthena, and he built this home for Parthena as a wedding gift, and it has all the new amenities of the 1830s. It has a porch, it has a double window, and one of them moves, you can actually open it to get a breeze, and it has two stories. Uh, there's two bedrooms upstairs. Uh, so it, it, you get a separation from the activity area to the sleeping area this way. I think right next to it right here, then we have the Hill McNeil store, if I'm reading that right, is it? That's right. Uh, but they dissolved their partnership in uh, 1832, and Sam Hill took over that store as an individual. And he had connections all along the waterways, and he could get you anything you wanted, uh, but you will pay dearly for it. <laughs> uh, but Sam could get for you anything you wanted. He, 
Now behind, which we see um, kind of a stable area, I guess, and, and that's something we haven't seen uh, yes. behind other buildings. What, why is that there and not behind other buildings? Well, Sam Hill's barn, uh, he also dabbled with farming. Uh, he ends up being one of the wealthier people, and he owns quite a bit of farmland, so he's got his uh, barn for his horses and where he stores his wagons and grain and such. Uh, and he would ship it to St. Louis or New Orleans, wherever the demand was greatest. I see just down the road, and maybe we can start walking there toward the tavern. You want to go to the tavern? I, I imagine that was, why don't you tell us about that? I would guess that that was probably the highlight of the social scene in New well, Salem. The tavern isn't like a tavern today. This is where people would go uh, to get a meal and a place to stay overnight so that they could um, be ready to go early in the morning and you'd have to pay. It was uh, So the tavern was more of a hotel by today's Sort of tavern. like today's bed and breakfast, yes. Uh -huh. uh, you could get a meal and a place to sleep and a bath if you wanted it. Was this here all during the time? Of yeah, that this is uh, actually one of the co-founders, James Rutledge, and he saw this as an opportunity for an income after he had uh, established a mill. I want to pause and, just uh, for a moment before we go in, because I see here, what, what are we looking at here, this red brick mill? That's, that's a root cellar. That's basically uh, where they would put all their root crops and such through the winter. We've kept things in there actually through February, and they keep quite well. It maintains the temperature between 50 and 55 degrees, just about what a cave would do. The other thing we see here, and maybe we can just spend a little time, we talked before about the self-sufficiency, the garden, and uh, we see here some oregano and different things, sage, so it's a spice garden. How accurate are the grounds, and, and to what extent do you try to recreate the lifestyle of New Salem? Well, this isn't exactly the type of garden that they have, but what we've done here is establish a culinary garden, garden because of the tavern, and they're going to use all these things in cooking and preparing foods. And we have hops, which is their way of getting their uh, yeast and the different things that the ladies would use in their cooking. So uh, most of the time, the garden would be a combination of vegetables, herbs, uh, and even flowers so that uh, you get a, a balance. Uh, but what we've done here, this is a culinary garden specifically for the tavern. Uh -huh. And in other sites uh, here in New Salem, you have uh, good-sized plots of, uh, of um, plantings that are made up of uh, such things as cotton and flax, well, I think you said. We have a big field where we grow the crops that they would have used for income primarily, like tobacco, cotton, flax. Uh, we have wheat, buckwheat, and rye, uh, broom corn. And we're going to plant watermelon and cantaloupe later. And then we also have vegetable gardens, which was called a dooryard garden. And it was primarily the job of the women and the children to take care of the garden. So and it's a lot of work. And some of the gardens that we have here are extremely small compared to what they would have had. Well, and really here, physically where we're standing, the garden and the root cellar is in many ways, is it not the means of life support through the winter months. You had to grow what you wanted, that's right. And if you didn't grow it, then you're going to have to do it without because it's not available. What about meat? How did they store that? Did they just slaughter animals fresh during the winter or did they dry the meat out like you have today maybe with uh, almost like a beef jerky kind of a process? Yeah, they did. Uh, they had dried meat. Uh, they also had what they called salt pork or, or beef where they would uh, Is that the same actually... as bacon that we have today or is that different? Well, no, that would be smoked and dehydrated. And they call it side pork instead of what we call bacon. It's usually much thicker. But the, uh, the, the meat that they're going to eat through the winter has to be preserved primarily by salting and preserving and dehydrating. Smoking, all these things were done. Uh, your fresh meat they're going to eat through the winter and they could keep it down the well where it would stay cold or they would put it in uh, the brine uh, and from what we get in the letters uh, they had a lot of difficulties with their meat keeping it and preserving. Charlie also uh, brought up back in the Lincoln Berry store the fact that there was a 1995 archaeological dig and I was curious what did you find there and, and was there anything that you found out that you didn't already know before? Well, yes. In 95, we had found a lot of pieces that winter of plates and dishes and things. And the archaeologists came out and they flagged it. And they could see where there was a concentration. 
and then they did their probing and as soon as they found a place where they, they were running in the different articles in the ground, then that's where they established their dig and we found two more buildings. Uh, one we think predated the village and the other one was uh, part of the, what we now call the second Barry Lincoln store, it may have been a storage room, or they might have stayed there for some time, we really don't know. But the artifacts that we found were the, the dishes and those are some of the things that we had reproduced. Uh, the tinware, we found tin cup, we found thimbles, pieces of glass, uh, and one of the flasks that I showed you down there, we found one and the top of it was slightly broken off, otherwise it would have been a real rare find to find one that was in its entire piece. Well, and that's something I think, again, that visitors ought to understand. When they see the plates, when they see the glassware, that's accurate. And you know it's accurate because of this archaeological pieces and the digging and studying that's going on. And as, as we referenced earlier, we know some of the qualities of life from the letters that the inhabitants wrote. Now, the other thing is we're standing outside the tavern. And I know there's some uh, meals that were served here, as we, we talked about before. And I guess, too, some of the meals and even the cooking process, I would guess, are done in the very same way they would have been done in the 1830s. Is that right? That's right. Let's well, go in. I'll show you. Yeah. This, this, some of these ladies turn out some beautiful meals here. They're very tasty. Well, smells good in here, ladies. What is it you're cooking today? Well, this is a peach and berry cobbler. And that one has just come out of the oven. We have cornbread still cooking and a rabbit stew back here on the fire that is not quite yet ready to come out. It's amazing in today's cookery, I mean, with the ovens and the microwaves, that this was the entire way that they had to prepare their meals. What kind of, what was the quality of the meals that they could produce, which what seems to be a very crude methodology for cooking? About the same as we get today. Is that right? About the same. Um, these pots cook about the same as a 350 oven. And we see a pot, it almost looks as if it's filled with ashes. What does that? It's what not are we filled with ashes. You are looking at the lid right here. All right. And the lid was covered with ashes. So and this one is cold. Mm -hmm. And I can pick it up now. And we buried this pot in the coals and put a few underneath just like a regular oven, and when it was done, this comes off, and there you have. And the aroma is great. It, this, uh, it, uh, some of the uh, apples, uh, and what is it actually? It's peach, peaches and raspberries. Peaches, all right. It's a, and are, are, what kind of spices would you have in there? Is it cinnamon? Cinnamon, cinnamon um, mace, allspice. They would have had a lot of the spices, plus all of the herbs out in the garden. She's and we have down here in the... Uh, in that, the I think... Is, what is this meal that we have? Coming out. This is Bobby. Here, Bobby, set it right up here where we can see it. Oh, that smells good, too. A little bit of uh, cornbread, it looks like. Mm -hmm. It is cornbread. Oh, that does smell good. Mm -hmm. How long does it take to bake that? Uh, this only took 30 minutes. 30 minutes. I had very hot embers. So when this was a tavern, uh, did they have borders here, or would people come and go as a restaurant? Both. And and what uh, were are these? These are, I presume, very typical of the kind of fare that was served. This time of year, the unless they had dried peaches and dried berries, this would be a not quite typical. But yeah, dried they would have had the cornbread definitely, the wild stew very definitely, which is still cooking. And you say that was rabbit stew? Charlie, could you look at that? Let's see take a look at it and see what's in here. I haven't looked at it yet. Oh, my. Wow. Looks great. What is it? Smells rabbit? Smells good. Rabbit. Bobby, it's rabbit and rice and rabbit and wild rice. Carrots. Oh. Now, if we were typical passengers, what would it cost us to have a meal here and 20, to sleep overnight? 25 cents to sleep here and 12 and a half, or tw excuse me, 25 cents to eat here and 12 and a half cents to sleep here. Now, Three bits total. Huh? Three bits total. Not 37 quite. Cents. 30. That's not three. Well, yeah, I guess it is. Sure, Isn't that right? Because the bit is 12 and a half cents. Yeah, all right. Here, we're My math. I'm a woman. My math isn't that fast. <laughs> <laughs> so two bits is a quarter. Right. Two bits is a quarter. And now, strapping youngins like yourself would sleep upstairs in the open loft. 
No beds, no rooms, no dividers. And on the far side, if we can maybe take a look, there's a ladder, and I guess we have the uh, people spending the night, the younger ones would climb and up the ladder. boys up there. And what was it, were there mattresses? They sleep just on the floor? Or on what? the floor, you threw your bedroll out on the hardwood floor. Uh -huh. They might have had some straws, but I wouldn't have trusted them. Not at this time of year. And they haven't changed them in, the, in since last fall. We bed bugs. Now, this is a, a very nice day that we're here. It's, it's pleasant outside, but the summer heat, there's certainly some warmth and it would be nice in the fall or on the cooler days. What is it like to be cooking these meals against this open fire on a hot summer day? It's hot. It's very hot. But that's also, I think, part of the reason why these women also wore clothing like this. The cool cotton, it's loose. Uh, the skirts are loose. I'm a lot cooler than a person would be in hot jeans or tight jeans. Hmm. And w w how do you know that the meals that you're preparing are historically accurate? A lot of them, at least I have cookbooks or I have recipes that date back even prior to this period. I go back to the 1700s hmm. with a lot of my recipes. So we literally just have recipe books as we have today? That's they didn't have recipes. A lot of these women didn't have recipe books. It was like, mom told me how to cook this. And it was like, you put a, a handful of this, you put a, a pinch of that, you put a whatever. And that's how, that's how we were passed down these recipes. We did not have recipe books. Recipe books didn't come in until about the mid-1800s. There were a few earlier, but the, the big recipe books came in, and most of these women just, you did it by trial and error. What kind of questions when you have all the tourists coming in about uh, the cooking? I imagine you get quite a number of questions about this. Okay, what kind of questions do you want? <laughs> <laughs> well, just tell us some of the things that people would want to know. How do you know when it's done? Well, trial and error, like you know how it's done in a regular oven. You've got to stick a toothpick in it, or in this case, you pulled a straw. I can't get wet. And that's what you use instead of the toothpick. Huh? Yes, this was how you tested whether your meal was done or not. Um, and I suppose like everything, after uh, cooking on a daily basis, you, you get that internal clock going. You just have a sense of how long something takes to make. Yes. I mean, they baked bread on here, they baked pies. It cakes. seems to us, with the modern instruments we have for cooking, that this would be almost an impossible task. But really, now that you've been doing it for some time, how difficult is it? I actually cook better here than I do at home. <laughs> I burn stuff at home. I don't burn stuff here. I burnt one meal out here is that right? in three years. Really? That was two weeks ago. I had my fire way too hot. Well, I, I wish we had uh, the capabilities of sharing with our viewers what it smells like, because it smells wonderful. Um, and I can just imagine on a cool fall evening for someone to come in, what a warm and inviting scene that must be after having traveled on the prairie to come and have these aromas in a warm room and a place to dry place to sleep. Yes, especially on the fall evening, I'd be doing a squash or a pumpkin pie. So you'd have all of those aromas coming in. I'd probably be doing a pork roast. Because I'm cooking for my family. I'm cooking for 10 or 11 people here all of the time. Not only just the people coming in. How did you wash the dishes, or how did they wash the dishes? Here we have Bobby over here. So that's your... Uh... I have wash water uh, in the smaller pan and rinse water in the larger. And it's about ready to be emptied and fresh put in. But uh, you just wash and rinse and dry and put away. Were they concerned enough about, I mean, did they have much trouble with food poisoning and all back in those days, or do we know? Nothing was left over. If you didn't eat it at that immediate meal, it went back on the fire, it was kept warm, or it was uh, kept as cold as you could down in the well or down in the creek, and you ate it the very next meal. So, I mean, it was like, this is rabbit stew. It'll be rabbit soup tonight. And if there's anything left over, which I doubt, it will become something 
tomorrow, but it probably will be totally gone. Now this cornbread might become what's left over, might become cornmeal um, like pancakes or mush like oatmeal, mm -hmm. but cornmeal mush. And what kind of, uh, what, what would they, uh, they have been drinking with their meals? Water. They did have, if they had the money, they could get coffee or they could have tea, but they didn't have a lot of that. They drank water or mostly water or milk. And milk was only for special occasions because the milk was used for my cooking and then the kids first. And uh, I don't know that we can get a shot of it, but just outside the door here we have some cows so that they would have had access to fresh milk. Yes. Well, Lady, thank you very much for showing us. It, uh, it's very, very interesting and uh, quite good. I wish I was in a <laughs> position to sit down for a meal myself. Well, Terry, this is the uh, Hill House, and it looks like Mrs. Hill's home today. I do. Hi, Hi Pathina. Glad to have you. Thank you for having us. What are you reading there? Well, I was just looking to see what the latest fashions were they are advertising in Springfield. You got the local paper. Yeah. Hmm. This is the Sangamo Journal. Comes out every week. Got the Springfield Fashionable Boot and Shoe Store. You know, Sam likes to have me looking the best. Today I was in the garden, and not the best I have to wear. But we're going to have some new boots and shoes in Springfield. Latest styles coming up. How long have you had that? this home, Parthena? Oh, Sam built this for me shortly after we were married. I couldn't help but notice it's two stories. That's unusual. Oh, I got two bedrooms upstairs. You know, we only have one son. So they're probably the only child in the village that had a bedroom by himself, let alone a bed. Got a sliding glass window, got a porch, too. Mighty nice sitting out there. Well, and, and, and Sam Hill was, I guess, one of the most prominent businessmen in the whole community, as you said before. He was one of the two successful merchants in this village. He did quite well financially, yes. And, uh, and thus, uh, this was, again, I believe the only two-story building in the village. Is right. that correct? Right. It's the only two-story building, and it has all the amenities that were really new in that period, which she was just telling you. It has a porch and a sliding window. And most folks don't have the separation that they have where their bedrooms are totally removed from the rest of the house. Well, and the other thing we see is just the the walls on the inside here, it's much brighter because they're, they're white. And uh, what, I guess the purpose of that was just the effect that we have, that it's much brighter on the inside than many of the other cabins and, that we've been in earlier. You have to clean your house often because it's so much lighter in here? <laughs> well, yes, I keep this very nice. So Hill was a uh, merchant when... Did he stay here in New Salem, or did he also move on? Sam moved to uh, Petersburg, uh, opened a store there, and he also bought up quite a bit of farm property. And um, according to the, what was it? How much money did he have when Over he passed Over $96,000 yeah. when he died. Is that right? Which, my gosh. When, what year did he die? Oh, 1850s. I can't quite remember which exactly. In the 1850s, oh. $96,000 would have been quite a fortune. Oh, my, yes. It would have been over a million yes. dollars today. Yes. Oh, easily, yeah. you know. Easily, yeah. That's an amazing amount of money. So what we're seeing here is an upper-class home as far as the society of New Salem was concerned. And I guess to what extent are the China pieces that we see on the hutches here, are they um, against totally accurate and all? These were all part of the Hills uh, property, and actually Parthena donated all this to New Salem. Uh, she was uh, quite a historian. She collected a lot of information about the village itself, and uh, she came back here and tried to show them exactly where the homes were located and such. What year did she die? 1896. 1896. So by that point, because she had been in the village with Abraham Lincoln, she knew this was going to be a historical site, and so these are actually her, her actual uh, plates and cups and saucers yeah. um, kept for the historical purposes that she realized New Salem had become prior to her death. Yeah. She was very interested in perpetuating as much as possible what she had for New Salem. 
Well, that's well, I, I appreciate you allowing us to come into your home and telling us about, uh, about your lifestyle. Glad to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, Charlie, we're just about done with our tour, but I wanted to ask you, when the families come here, how much time should they allow, would you say, for the, their visit? Well, it's three quarters of a mile from one end of the village to the other, and I would say that you, a minimum of two, two and a half hours for a family. And for people who are real interested in history, it's probably going to be more like I would prefer to have like four hours personally. Uh, One thing we didn't see today uh, is the, the Sangamo River, uh, which is at the extreme end of the uh, village. Is there anything out there for them to take a look at? Well, if you go down to the river, that's actually where the village started, and that's where the water mill, uh, which is a grist mill, which is for grain grinding, and a sawmill combination, and then Denton Offutt's store and Clary Saloon, where the ruffians hang out, are all down by the river. You know, we're, we're here again on a beautiful spring day. Of course, the Midwest can be pretty hot during the middle of the summer, so I guess another good thing to tell families is if they were to come in the middle of the summer, maybe they'd want to be carrying a little bit of water on them for uh, drinking purposes as they walk around. Well, they can get water at the visitor center, and then there's a water uh, fountain right over here by the restrooms. But uh, a lot of people, if they aren't used to that, they should bring their own water. That's no problem here. All right. Well, listen, I, I appreciate very much you sharing your insights on the history of New Salem. We really only had the time to take a look at really just a handful of the overall village that's here so there's a lot more for people to see if you to come out and take a tour of this yourself but the history both of this this village which really was the formula formulative years of abraham lincoln's young adulthood right uh, as well as just what life was like on the prairie in the 1830s is really uh, i think a uh, a living history lesson for all of us. Right, there's a tremendous amount of history here. Uh, we have something that ought to interest everyone. Well, thanks so much. Thank you. Very much. Appreciate you Come joining back. us on the Illinois Channel. This program is brought to you in cooperation with the Springfield Convention and Visitors Bureau and the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity Bureau of Tourism. You're watching the Illinois Channel an independent nonprofit corporation formed to provide gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois. If you have any comments or questions on our programming, please email us at illinoischannel at aol.com. Or if you have any questions about the Illinois Channel, please visit our website at www.illinoischannel.org.